Our first session today uh, is called Take Charge to Take Off, and I'm very uh, excited, very delighted to invite our, uh, introduce our speaker, Mr. Binod Shankar. Binod Shankar, uh, I'm sure most of you in this room will definitely know him, or at least seen him, seen his videos, podcasts, following him on LinkedIn. I sure do. I've been following him on LinkedIn uh, from the time I met probably five years back, uh, and I've been following his post, uh, a very genuine, very uh, relatable post, which he kind of posts on LinkedIn. Uh, so great to have him today on the stage today. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, uh, a very interesting profile. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of t talk about his profile uh, a bit here. Um, so after the CA and CFA, right, and he had a very successful corporate career. Uh, he quit as an executive director at one of the asset management firms uh, in Dubai, uh, post which I think he also led a financial training company, which he exited, uh, uh, you know, uh, after a sale to Kaplan. Uh, what's more interesting is, is his personal side, right? I've, and I'm, I, it's been a very aspirational uh, to see that journey of his personal side as well. Uh, he's an endurance athlete. Uh, he, he's submitted around 13 high altitude mountains across the globe. He's a marathon runner. Uh, he's uh, a regular speaker at uh, financial channels uh, in, in uh, Dubai and Middle East, and um, now an author as well, right? So a great journey. Uh, I'd love to hear him on the stage, and I assume it's going to be the same with you all. Uh, I welcome on stage Mr. Binod Shankar today. Thanks, Binod. Yeah, sure. Uh, just a reminder, I think Brinda already uh, spoke about this. Rinda already spoke about this. Uh, so there is an app. Uh, there will be a Q&A session post the, the speaker session. Uh, so request you all to download that app and send in your questions. Uh, we will kind of, uh, as, as it feeds in during the Q&A session, uh, I'll try and uh, raise it basis the time availability. But please do start uh, putting your questions as... as uh, it's, I think, what, Rinda, you want? CFA Society India. CFA Society India. Yeah? Android and uh, the iPhone as well, yeah. So let me all ask you a question. Let's be honest here, right? Please, no bullshitting on Saturday morning. And we are here on a Saturday, and you're going to go back to your offices on Monday, Tuesday, okay? My, my mistake. And I want you to tell me honestly, how many of you are really, truly, gloriously looking forward to going back to office on Monday? And be honest about it, you know? And don't, don't, don't look around you like your boss or colleagues. Okay, you may not have a job on Tuesday, but it's okay. But still, how many of you are really thrilled? As in, you, you're going to wake up on Tuesday morning looking forward to going back to work. Show of hands. In a room of how many people? In, uh, 150 people, we have 10 raised hands. That's how much percentage? Less than 10%. 5%. So 95% of people in this room are not thrilled about going back to office on a Tuesday. So which means out of 95%, some people are like, okay, it's okay, I'm okay. it's a job. Some people are like, holy shit, I don't want to go back to this place again. No. Why am I, what am I doing here? Why is this? Why is this that so many people are disengaged and stressed and miserable at work, right? Why is that happening? So as um, Mohan mentioned, I have been uh, teaching CFA prep. I taught CFA prep for 10 years. I've mentored hundreds of candidates. I've uh, coached many executives over the last five years. And I see this pattern off, on and off, right? And I've talked to 23-year-olds, 50-year-olds, 35-year-olds. Story is not very different. They're all disengaged. So why is it happening? Well, that's the whole purpose of this uh, talk, right? How, how to make it not happen. But before that, because I'm an aviation freak and I love planes, I'm going to show you two planes, right? Which I'm sure you can identify with. At least the first one is an Airbus. The second one is an F-16. We all know the difference between an Airbus and F-16, even if you know nothing about planes. But one huge difference is that the F-16 doesn't require an autopilot, doesn't fly on autopilot. 
right? The Airbus, most of the time, flies in autopilot. Do you know what autopilot is, right? Yeah? It's a machine that flies the plane. Now, what does that mean in terms of carriers? What does F-16 have to do with carriers? Most of us have left our carriers in autopilot. We are sleepwalking through our carriers. We have handed over the controls of our carriers to who? To our bosses, <laughs> to HR, to somebody, right? But not us. And that is something we should stop immediately. This autopilot will not work. And guess what? Even for an Airbus, what is the riskiest time during a flight? Takeoff, landing. Let's not talk about landing. Let's talk about takeoffs. Do you think the autopilot is in charge during a takeoff? No. Who is in charge during a takeoff? The pilot. Well, both pilot and co pilot, right? You cannot leave it to, to, the, to the machine, right? So, in other words, during the riskiest times, the human has to intervene. You have to get involved. So, the whole idea of today is that you get involved in your career, right? But before we go into the 10 strategies that you know, Mohan mentioned earlier and introduced me, let me talk about two realities, right? Two realities. So, first, first is what you call the market reality. And I'm going to say some very harsh truths, but they are, they are truths nevertheless, right? Whether you like it or not. Yeah? First is that we have about, this is a rough number, right? 10,000 pass outs every year in India, level one, level two, level three. This is a rough number, okay? Approximate. Okay? How many vacancies do you think are there in India in that space of financial services? Give me a number every year. Okay, let me rephrase the question. How many vacancies, how many positions are there today? Not open, but how many positions are there today in the analyst portfolio manager space in India overall? Mutual funds, hedge funds, alternate investment funds, buy side, sell side, everything. Total number. Give me a number. 4,000? So, so, so the number is around 7,000. Do you see a problem here? We have about 10,000 people passing out every year. The number of fixed positions, which is not going to change by much, maybe by 10% every year, is about 7,000. Give or take a few hundred, probably. Okay. So we have a gap. It's a small market, especially when we talk about core finance. It's a very small market, right? There is, of course, oversupply. And let's not forget that two qualifications still dominate this market, whether we like it or not. One is... I'm a chartered accountant, there are quite a few chartered accountants here. Okay, we love our provision, and it's there, been there for 80 years or God knows how long. But because of regulations, blah, 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 CA dominates even now, right? And the second is MBA, especially for a premier institute because of the um, branding and campus interviews and things like that. So that is the market reality, right? Okay. Now, what is the employee reality? What is the reality of you guys? <laughs> okay, let me talk about you guys, okay? And it's not going to be very complimentary, okay? I'll give you a heads up right now. I'll talk about myself initially. When I qualified as a CA, and I'm not going to say the date because that will reveal my age. When I qualified as a CA, uh, I remember it was in July. My friend called me. He said, you have passed. Level 2, final. I was thrilled. You know, he came, picked me up in his bike. I still remember. We went for a ride. This is Trivandrum at night. Okay, we went for a ride, and we celebrated by what? Having masala dosa at Indian Coffee House, okay, which was then it was like you know big deal, 30 years ago. But for the weeks and months afterwards, I was like, that's it. I have achieved everything in life <laughs> because you pass CA, right? You no, know, you pass chartered accountancy, first attempt, blah blah blah. You have done it, right? And then of course, over the many years later, <laughs> realization struck me, right? So what happens today, or what's What's happening, what happened to me when I was a chartered accountant is happening to CFA candidates today as well, right? What is the issue? So, they all want quick results, right? You pass level three, somebody should come knocking on their door <laughs> with a job for what? Core finance, right? Something in core finance. And as someone told me recently, qualified doesn't mean job ready. It does not mean job ready. If there's one thing you should take from this slide, it is this. Okay, just because you know how to do valuations and write exam papers doesn't mean that you know anything about valuation in real life. Okay? People stop learning a lot. After they finish the CA or CFA, that's it. Oh yeah, take the books, throw it away, or give it to somebody else who needs to study for CA or CFA. Right? Copy-paste. Right? So what Vinay did or what Rohan did, Sakshi will do. 
or Shashank would do, right Shashank? Or Saumya might do. So we don't actually think about ourselves. We always try and copy from others, right? Yeah. And of course, spoon feeding. Everyone wants to be told how to do it. Tell me how I should live my life. <laughs> Tell me how I should, uh, which school I should go to, which college I should go to, which career I should pick, which girl I should marry. <laughs> You know, going back to the cultural construct here, okay? Which employer I should join? So spoon feeding. That is the reality for the majority of employees, okay? So if we talked about two realities, the market reality and the employee reality. Now I'm going to talk about the strategies, the 10 strategies, right? Yeah. By the way, this will be available on YouTube uh, later, so you don't need to uh, record this. Uh, it's been recorded already. What is the first point? Where do you start? If you're looking at your strategy for your career, what is the starting point? Can someone tell me? Sorry? Values, maybe? Ram, any idea? Money? Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Straight away to the point, okay? Spoken like a true CFA charter holder. Money, okay? So, I always like to start from uh, something called Know Yourself. In fact, my book starts with that as well, Know Yourself. I think it's something that we don't know ourselves, right? And Whenever I look at people, when I look at myself, the mistakes I have made, the mistakes my clients have made, mistakes my students have made, or the successes they have achieved, right? It all boils down to what? Do you know yourself? And what do you mean by know yourself? So there are three things, and I want you to make very clear notes of the three things. The first is, do you know your traits? I'll talk about that. The second is, do you know your values? And we're going to have a very interesting exercise very soon, so keep your phones ready, okay? Don't go through Facebook or WhatsApp, just keep it ready. And thirdly, we're going to talk about goals. So traits, values, goals. This is going to drive your career going forward. This is the foundation. Without this, other, other stuff doesn't make sense. Good? So what are traits? So definition of traits is a relatively stable way of thinking to describe a person. That's the definition of a trait. Okay. And we have this fantastic, very popular, scientifically validated framework called OCEAN. Have you heard of this before? Anyone? OCEAN framework? O-C-E-A-N. OCEAN framework is basically, it captures all the thousands of personality traits, it has distilled them into five core personality traits. And you score on a, on a scale of zero to 10 for each. And there you know exactly where you stand. So let me give you an example. What does openness mean? What do you think openness means on the extreme side? Come on guys, let's have more interaction. Sorry? Open to learning, exactly. Open, curious, creative. What does not open mean? Rigid, close-minded, cautious, practical, conventional. Right? There's no harm in that, but sometimes it doesn't help you. Conscientiousness, what does that mean, the second one? High. Hardworking. Diligent, orderly. If you're on the low side, it's opposite, which is what? Impulsive, careless, not reliable. You come to the one extraversion. Like, so people have called me an extrovert. I'm sure some of you are extroverts as well. Extraversion is what? On the extreme side, it is what? Warm, seeking adventure. On the low side, it is quiet, reserved. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah? Nerdy. Right? The nerd, nerd comes to mind, right? Then you have agreeableness. What do you, what do you sort of comes to your mind when people say he's agreeable? What is that, what comes to your mind? Agreeable is what? Empathetic, yeah? Helpful, right? And what is disagreeable? Other end. Critical, suspicious, unhelpful, right? We, know, we all know people like that, right? Especially some bosses of ours, right? Probably fall in that category, right? You can't name them here, of course. And last but not the least is the neuroticism, which is what? On the high scale, you're anxious and unhappy. On the low scale, you are calm and secure. Can you see yourself on this scale? Probably. Yeah. There's a test, and I'll send you a link to this test. There are a few conditions to be met, though, before I send the link to you. So if you know where you stand on this, it'll help you choose your career. That's the bottom line. So let me ask you a question. If you want to become an investment banker, investment banking analyst, tell me where should, should you stand in this five? High or low? Openness? High. Consciousness? 
very hard, <laughs> very hard, right? Like 15 hour days, right? No life. Extraversion? Well, it's okay. You don't need to be an extrovert, right? You can be in the back office, it's okay, no, not a problem. Agreeableness? Doesn't really matter, okay? You can be a bit of a jerk, it's fine. In fact, most people working in investment banking are jerks, apparently, right? Neurotism? Should you be anxious or calm? Calm, right? So the key thing here is, and that is true for analysts as well, if you become an equity analyst or debt analyst or whatever, high openness, high consciousness, and low neurotism. Okay? Everything else can be managed. What about if you're in sales, client-facing? If you're in sales, openness, high. Extraversion, uh, consciousness, yeah. it's okay, yeah? Most people in sales don't deliver what they promise, right? <laughs> Extraversion, very high, right? You, have, you can't be a shy person in sales, right? It doesn't work that way. Agreeableness, yes, you have to agree whatever the client says, right? Client is always right. And neurotism, low. So you see where I'm going with this, right? Okay. So that is about the traits part. So I said there are three things to know yourself. What are the three? Do you remember? Traits, values, and goals. I'm going to talk about values. Now take out your phones, please. This is a simple exercise. Very simple exercise. And very productive exercise. Take off your phone. Don't look at your apps. And I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step exercise. Okay? Number one, open a notepad. Something to write, take notes on. You have some app on your phone, notepad. I use Gmail <laughs> as my note-taking tool. Everyone done? We are, we are going to do it together, okay? Are we okay in the back? Rohan, we fine? Good? Okay, step two, very important. Write down 12 separate statements about something that's either important to you or you want to achieve or enjoy doing. Specific statements. Let me give you some examples. Financial freedom, well-being, respect, authenticity, achievement, leadership, family. You know what I'm saying? Things like that. Write down 12 separate statements. I'll wait. Think carefully about what is very dear to you in life. What is like, you know, non-negotiable. What do you enjoy doing? What you might do if the people, no one even paid you for it? But what people said you are good at, like your boss or your colleagues. I'm just giving you tips. Ram finished early. I think he's got money, 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 <laughs> money, 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 and money. <laughs> Multiply. <laughs> it's okay to have money, it's fine. <laughs> Are we good? In the back there, guys, I can't see you from here. Are we good? Raise your hands if you're finished the exercise, please. Raise your hands if you finish, please. Thank you. Okay, I think most of them. Sorry. Oh, sorry. So most people actually have finished it. So we're going to continue. Right. Now that you've got the 12 statements, yeah? Delete the four least important. It gets tougher now. <laughs> Delete the four least important from your list. Done? In the back there. Sandeep, you good? You are only eight. <laughs> Very focused, yeah? Extremely focused guy. That'll become a problem later. <laughs> Delete the four least important. Done? Okay. Look over them again, delete another four. 
delete the four least important again. Rinda, we good? Everyone, we okay? So we have deleted how many so far? Eight out of twelve. You are now left with yeah. The four left are your core values. You're welcome. What you need to do basically is save it and look at it now and again to remind yourself who you are and what's important to you. Right? Now, this exercise is efficient, but I learned the hard way. I didn't have this tool. So 14 years ago, I was executive director of finance as Mohan introduced me. I was sitting in a 39th floor of a skyscraper in Bahrain. I hated my job. Stressful job, politics, corruption, very well paid, great title, listed company. And that one hit me what my values were. So a lot of the time when you go through stress is what reveals your values, right? So I found out what my values were. Next day morning, I gave back my access card and BlackBerry. That shows how old I am, right? BlackBerry. And walked out of the company after one month notice period and started my own company and the rest is history. But you don't have to go through that. Lucky you because you have this exercise. Be good? Right, so we have our traits, we have our values, but that's not enough, right? What's the third one? Goals. How are values linked to goals? Values are always linked to goals. Remember that. Whenever you think about career goals, it is very closely linked to your values. So, have you heard this expression before? Of course we have, right? It is one of the two most famous expressions, right? Khandan ke izzat and... <laughs> Yes, this is the two major cultural constructs in a deeply conservative country like India, right? Has to be, right? Lokya kahenge means what? What will people think if I change education or careers or jobs or clothes or where I live or the watch I wear or the phone I have in my hands, right? So this core values you just found out now should enable you to not live like that, right? And escape the FOMO syndrome. Everyone's different. Something that someone is thrilled at something but Two other people are miserable at the same career. You know that, right? Sometimes. Yeah. Comparison, I say, is always a thief of joy. Don't compare yourself to other people because everyone is unique. Everyone has their own journey. Right? Yes, he's making X lakhs, he's making Y lakhs, that's fine. But maybe lakhs is not what's for you. You have something else in mind. Goals must be based on values and traits. We talked about it earlier. Okay? So the question here is, what does success mean to you? What is your definition of success? My definition of success might be different from Ram's or Amit's or Rinda's or Anirudh's or Farthin's. Agreed? Very important. A lot of the time we copy-paste definitions of success from others. It doesn't work. We end up being miserable because of that. Right, so that is strategy one. Strategy two, straightforward. Explore careers. I was talking to CFHR to holders, I think, Rinda and Rajini. And everyone wants to get into co-finance, right? They either become an equity analyst or investment banker. What's the other one? Anything else apart from that? Sorry? Fund manager, exactly. That's it, right? No one is talking about the very other careers that a CFA charter holder can do, right? There is, you can go into KPOs. And there are lots of KPOs here. Very professionally run, right? You have lots of opportunities. You learn a lot. You can meet clients. You, have, you can actually do offshore work as well, as well as onshore work. You can even sometimes join a client, for example, if you, if you, if you want, if you're really that good. But no one talks about that much, yeah? Or private equity, for example. People don't talk about that much as well. It's actually picking up in India. And so a lot of areas in that, that, that are CFHR for fintech, right? And Sandeep can talk about fintech, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's involved in blockchain and cryptocurrency, for example. Or quantitative investing or academia. I used to teach, right? For eight years in CFA prep. Okay? So I suggest all of you get hold of this fantastic document from CFA Society India called the Career Guide. How did they get access to this, uh, Rinda? Yeah, you can download this, right, from the website, right? It's amazing. It, it covers pretty much everything. What is each sector, description, the organization structure, the roles, and very importantly, the skills and competencies for each role. For example, the third strategy is about acquiring skills. And this is a very important uh, framework. It tells you whether it's investment banking or equity analyst or debt capital markets or credit rating analyst, right, or academia, what are the, if you look at extreme left, hard skills and soft skills. Absolutely important to know before you even apply for a job in this, before you even go for an interview, right? So you can see the extreme two, right, research analyst and portfolio manager. What is the difference you see between the two? 
Can someone quickly, let's, ha let's see how good you are at analysis, right? <laughs> what is the difference between the last two, this one and this one? What's changing? Yeah? What else? More of hard skills where? Analyst. And more of soft skills? You see what's happening here, right? The numerical ability is medium, but high here, right? Even financial spreadsheet, medium, high here. But what is high here than this one, which is knowledge of markets and what else? People, management, right at the bottom. I don't know why you put it right at the bottom. It should be right at the top, actually. People management, right? And this grid exists for every single career in that career guide. Get hold of it. It will make your life much easier. Also, acquisition of skills means knowing how to set up a financial model, knowing how to run valuation models, right? You probably heard of this company before, right? Example, CFI, FMI, breaking into Wall Street. You also have Coursera, Udemy, blah, 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 right? A lot of free resources out there. Go out there and learn the skills. Pick them up. Okay, absolutely essential if you're going to be an analyst anywhere. Strategy four, right? Curiosity, upgrade curiosity. I love this quote from Charlie Munger, right? Intense interest in any subject is indispensable if you're going to excel in it. Do you agree? You really have to be extremely curious about something to go deeper, right? And how do you get curious? Well, you can watch Bloomberg and, you know, read Economic Times, Financial Times, which you should do or watch CNBC, for example, that should be part of your regular diet, daily diet, right? In the morning or evening, instead of watching the nonsense that goes on in Indian TV a lot of the time, which we don't want to get into right now, okay? But you should also go to, have you heard of this guy? Who hasn't, right? Ashwat Damodaran is the guru of valuation. Everyone knows him, right? Yeah. And he has lots of free resources on, uh, on, on online, YouTube videos. There's actually an excellent blog of his, I think ashwatdamodaran.com. Go to his blog. Every few weeks, he uploads a fantastic article on valuation of a company or something, on ESG or Tesla or something. Okay, amazing resource, amazing resource, right? Pick it up, yeah. Books. I read about 30 to 40 books a year. So the last five years, I've read about 150 to 200 books, all nonfiction, all on finance, management, psychology. I'll recommend three books to you, well, actually four books, including mine. We'll come to the end, so that it doesn't sound like a call to action. <laughs> Atomic habits, absolutely essential. It helps you build habits, it tells you about the compounding effect, it tells you about the identity change you need to make habits stick. It's a worldwide bestseller, almost everyone I know talks about this book. Okay. Timothy Ferris, tribe of mentors, this guy has talked about 150 top stars, sports stars, you know, um, uh, analysts, fund managers, uh, uh, what do you call, film stars and got from them the essence of, okay, what do they think youngsters should do? What would they have done differently? Very interesting, very, very interesting, very frank, okay? It's a compendium of interviews. And number three, have you heard of Naval Ravikant? Of course you have. Amazing book, okay? This is not just about investing or startups or entrepreneurship, it's about everything, right? It's about life, it's about skills, it's about life lessons, okay? So again, it's a compendium of his famous quote, right? And of course, if I talk about three books, I have to talk about my book as well, right? So, four months ago, I wrote a book called Let's Get Real. This has been the pipeline for about 10 years, okay, pretty much. I've been thinking about it for long. And I wrote the book, and it's something that is meant for careers, for people, in, especially in starting and mid-career. Mid career. And the subtitle is 42 Tips for the Stuck Manager. 42 tips for the stuck manager, right? Because I was a stuck manager once. I was a stuck entrepreneur once, and I know exactly what it is to go through it. So full of tips, and there are two, you know, basic reviews from two famous personalities, but I like the one at the bottom, right? I like what he said about what, how he reviewed the book. This guy's the CEO of a global company. He said, you know, someone who tra traveled his life journey with his eyes wide open. His strategy has been to learn from everything that happens to him and around him. This is exactly the strategy I'd advise you as well. Curiosity, right? Keep your eyes open, learn from what's happening to you. You'll learn a lot that way. Yeah. By the way, the books are available on sale outside. You've probably seen a table with about 100 books. Um, a young man called Talib is standing outside uh, with the books. Feel free after the event to talk to him and grab a copy of the book, right? I've had it delivered here. Right, number five, 
someone I talked to recently, one of the CF, senior CFA charter holders based in Mumbai, he said whenever he talks to candidates, right, that he wants to hire, okay, the first thing he asks them is to show any work that they have done. Okay. How many times have you seen on LinkedIn people writing passionate about finance? Have you seen that? Please don't do it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Okay? It's very cheesy and very cringe, cringe worthy, right? Passionate about finance. The other thing you see is financial evangelist. <laughs> have you seen that one? Financial evangelist, financial advocate, passionate about finance. This means nothing, right? It means nothing, right? Because saying I'm passionate about finance means nothing if you cannot justify your passion. You go to interview and someone asks you, what do you feel about finance? I'm passionate about finance. Okay, so what do you have to show? Okay. And nine out of 10 times when my friend, CFA charter holder friend, asks people to show a model, nine out of 10 times, what do they do? What do you think they do? Any guesses? They never come back. <laughs> it's very easy, right? They never come back to him because it's just too difficult to do hard work, right? And to stand out, yeah? Pick a sector, pick a company in the sector, run a financial model, show your valuation model, right? Invest in markets. That will impress the hell out of any employer, anywhere. The good thing is very few people do it. So you'll stand out. Yeah? We, of course, recognize these two people here, right? Who doesn't? One is a mentor, one is a mentee. So when I was 19, I had, after finishing three years of a very bad academic period between 16 and 19 years of age. So at between 16 and 19, I got, uh, I, I failed my IIT entrance out of many failures. I got into plus two, got a very mediocre score in plus two, couldn't get to engineer, in, into engineering, got into BCom in a very average college, didn't go to college, didn't study, watched India-Pakistan cricket matches for the entire three years on TV, came out with a second class degree in BCom, right? Wrote common admission test for MBA twice, didn't get through twice. Uh, that's my track record between 16 and 19, right? At 19, I met this guy who was the managing partner of a chartered accountancy firm in Trivandrum, my home city. He changed my life. He changed my life completely. How? He just believed in me. He just simply believed in me, you know? He liked my communication skills, he liked my confidence, and he started putting me in key projects. Three months after I joined Articleship, I was leading a major bank audit. Can you imagine? At the age of 19. Can you imagine the confidence boost it gives you when a 15-year, a chartered accountant, a senior chartered accountant, right, respecting the community, tells you, by the way, I'm replacing the head of the audit with you. It pretty much changes your world, right? That pretty much has driven my confidence for the last 30 years. So get a mentor. What does a mentor do to you? Well, a mentor does a lot of things, right? Career goals, career guidance, expand networks, and basically it takes your career to a different level. That's what it does, like my, my, my chart account uh, partner did, right? I have not looked back since. I nailed all groups of the CFA in first attempts, mainly because of his encouragement, right? He used to give me enough leave, never used to stress me out. I have never heard him criticizing me even once during the two years I was there, right? How do you get a mentor? Can someone tell me? How do you get a mentor? Suggestions? Mohan? When you work with someone very closely, anyone else? Anirudh? Can you raise your voice? Network, exactly. Anything else? Saumya? Can't hear you. Dedication, right? So all that is fine. But to get a mentor, you don't go to a mentor and ask for mentorship, by the way. It doesn't happen. The mentors probably will come to you and say, hey, you look interesting, you look like you have potential, maybe we should talk. That's how it happens. So what should you show? Performance, potential, ambition, open-mindedness. You know, mentors don't like to deal with uh, wilting flowers, you know what I mean? Like you give them criticism and they go into hiding for the next one year, no. Right? This is what you need from, and I'm going to give you a few tips on mentorship later, how to, how to get a mentor at the end of this presentation. And we have something in CFA Society India, right? I mean, uh, Monica Chopra, I believe, who is not here today, had this very interesting initiative uh, called FEMTOR, which was started recently. This is women CFA charter holders mentoring women CFA candidates. Am I right, Rinda? Yes. 
So it's fantastic because you have higher level of comfort, you have a role model. Um, basically, you have to be a full-time member of CFA Society India. So this is a plug for CFA Society India. Is Saumik here? Uh, you have to be the, the 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 person who is going to mentor you will be uh, a CFA charter holder probably. Yeah. Um, minimum two hours over four to six months. Minimum two hours a month for four to six months is the mentoring period, right? And uh, this is the email address. If anyone wants to reach out, please note down the email address, femtor at cfa, india .cfa -society .org, and someone will probably get back to you. In fact, I want to applaud CFA Society India and the CFA Institute India office because they have had two major initiatives. One initiative is the fantastic Young Women Investment Program, which was launched by none other than Mr. Amit Chakravarti, who is sitting right here in front. Amit, can you please stand up? Come on. Everyone knows you. Come on. Turn around, please. Let me see you. <laughs> which, by the way, has been rolled out across many countries in the globe, if I'm not mistaken, right? Six countries in the world. It's amazing, right? The second fantastic initiative, which is again focused on women, again from India, is this one. So it's, it's fantastic that, you know, we have, as a country, we have come with these initiatives in, in this particular field. So well done. And please sign up, right? Now, <laughs> I'm sure you can identify with this, right? The nice boss who smiles all the time, but behind your back, <coughs> right? Or criticize it to your front, right? If you look at a lot of the people who are miserable at work, and I've met many people, what is the biggest mistake they have made? One is, of course, they don't know themselves. We talked about that. The second issue is they don't know the culture. They don't know the culture. I was talking to a 23-year-old CFA Level 3 candidate a few weeks ago, last week. He's been through three jobs in three years. <laughs> three jobs in three years. Smart guy, well-educated, articulate, confident. But yeah, he doesn't know how to assess Culture, he does not assess people, okay? I met a 50-year-old, 5-0 person, HR, CHRO, okay, who is based in Europe, and she went to a company, joined the company, regretted it, but stuck on for two years, right? And now she's going through therapy because of the psychopathic CEO she had to deal with during those two years. Why? Because she didn't get the culture. So what is culture? If everyone says corporate culture, corporate culture, what is corporate culture, really? Can someone tell me? Definition? Someone in the back? Yes? Can you raise your voice, please? Can you give someone a mic, someone in the back? Is how you work with? When no one is watching, how you work. Oh, oh it's how you work when nobody is watching you. Any other definition, Sachin? Let me ask experienced guys in the front. The core values, right? Amit? You have been through many <laughs> careers and employers. Intersection between your values and company values. So the, exactly, so the definition of corporate culture, if you Google it, right, it's basically what? A, a set, set of beliefs, traditions, values, and behaviors among people in an organization. That is what culture is. But why do we always make mistake about the culture? Why do we always get into the wrong culture? Any idea? It's, it's like Sachin made a very, it is not readily <laughs> out there. In the interview, they will tell you about everything, right? <laughs> huh? Rule, responsibility, org structure, what time you should come in, how many, how many, how many toilet breaks you are allowed, right? How much leave you have every year, huh? who your boss is. They will tell you about culture. Yeah. Right. That's it. Absolutely. Yes. No, I missed that point. Thank you for raising that. We don't care about the culture. Who cares about culture, right? Title, brand, role, sexy, right? Big multinational, join the company, great salary. Then you get in and find out that your boss is an asshole. So, what do you need to know about the culture? So how do you find out about the culture? How do you find out about the culture? Anyone? Sorry. Before you join the company. Before you join the company, how do you find out? After you join the company, it's a bit too late, right? <laughs> Sorry? Network. LinkedIn, network, references, Glassdoor, right? Vasta, whatever, right? Anything? 
uh, you'll find out, right? The interview itself will tell you a lot. The interview, the recruitment process itself will tell you a lot about the culture, doesn't it? The way the email is sent to you, the way the guy talked to you in the interview, does he ask questions to you about you? Are you allowed to ask questions back? One major issue is that people don't ask questions. Do you agree? When you go to, how many of you have actually asked <laughs> sensible questions to the interviewer <laughs> during the interview? How many? Raise your hands and be honest about it. The front guys is, I'm, I'm exempting you. <laughs> you would know. How many? No one. Right? The only question you will ask is, when can I join? <laughs> when will I get my promotion? Okay. When is the, how much is the bonus over here? That's it. And like Amit said, we are too focused on superficialities. So of course, in a culture, we need to find out who is the boss, who is the company, and who is the team. Three things. Of these three, who is going to make the maximum effect on you? Exactly. Okay? The boss. The boss will make or break you or your career. Okay? Whether you like it or not. He has total control over your life in many situations. Okay? So get used to that and try to understand how the culture works before you go to an interview next time. Yeah? Unlock value. Unlock value of what? The CFA charter. So let me ask you, because we talked about the title of the, of the, of the talk, take charge, take off, 10 strategies to leverage your charter and fly high. So we have to talk about leveraging the charter now, right? So let me ask you, right, especially candidates, what is the use or value of the CFA charter? Quickly. Can someone tell me what's the use or value of the CFA charter? How does it make you stand out? Better recognition, yes? Ethics, Hishank? Ethics? I can't hear you, boss. You have to speak loudly and clearly. Competencies, okay? Established credibility, right? So all that is fine. But an MBA will teach you about research skills. You can learn that from MBA, right? Valuation research. CFA doesn't teach you about soft skills. It doesn't, right? Unless you come to events like this. See, if it doesn't teach you about uh, many financial skills, as in financial modeling, things like that, technical skills, it's bookish, right? So, but interestingly, it adds a lot of value. What is the value? One, you are in a unique position to make sense of numbers and give an opinion on numbers. Please don't forget that. It is very important. An MBA holder or even a chartered accountant might struggle with that, but you have the underlying accounting fundamentals, on top of that you have an overlay of analysis and valuation portfolio management. That is unrivaled. That is unrivaled. The second is what Shashank and some other people mentioned, which is what? The ethical framework. Okay? I'm a chartered accountant, we have a code of ethics, I'm a CFA chart holder, we have a code of ethics. Which one do you think is tougher and more comprehensive? <laughs> Any guesses? CFA. Why do you think the qualification is still respected globally even after 60 years? One reason is ethical framework. When you are in a big company, when you have very difficult decisions to make, what is that one guide you have to make those decisions? Ethical framework. Don't forget that. It is something that most people don't have. Most qualifications don't have. Okay? Thirdly, and I was talking to CFA Chardold recently, most of the failures in big companies don't happen because of bad investment decisions. They happen because of bad operations, sales, compliance, or do you agree? Or risk management. If you look around, whether India, US, anywhere, right? So, as a result, you are an able to, ability to become an all-rounder. You should eventually become an all-rounder. That's what the CFA Charter does to you. You should be able to handle marketing, management, sales, structuring, compliance, products, operations. Because you have learned all this during your studies, level one, level two, level three, all the way from ethics to behavioral finance and valuation and accounting, you have learned all this. Why can't you be an all-rounder, right? So stop looking at narrow definitions. Stop focusing only on specialization. Beyond a point, specialization will not help, especially with computers and AI getting traction very fast. Okay? Now, the next point I want to talk about is, of course, the T-shaped skills, which CFA Institute talks about a lot, which is linked to this whole idea of unlocking value from the CFA Charter. What is T-shaped skills? Have you heard about this? Anyone? T-shaped? So, sorry? Exactly. Depth and breadth. Depth and breadth. The I is the depth and the, 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 the horizontal I is the breadth, right? 
So this is a very interesting quote from this book. Have you heard of this guy, Yuval Noah Harari? Very famous author, right? He wrote a book many years ago called, well, 10 years ago called Homo Deus, I think. It's becoming easier to replace humans, not because computers are smart, but because humans have been specializing. We have become narrower and narrower and narrower. And guess what? It becomes easier and easier to replace us. If you're just doing equity research or you know equity analysis, guess what? You'll find a, a computer that does that. If you're just writing analyst reports, guess what? A computer can do that. Computer cannot do breadth, right? And what is breadth, by the way? If depth is technical and domain expertise, what is breadth? Go on, speak. Skill, what skills are we talking about? Management skills, soft skills, collaboration, communication, creativity, right? Things like that. So the T-shaped, which you should try to practice, is you should have domain expertise in one or two areas. That is there, that is required. As a CFA candidate, your domain expertise must be in valuation or analysis or portfolio management, correct? Your breadth, which is what most people miss out on, which is why people don't make it beyond a certain stage in most cases, is what? Leadership, soft skills, right? Which is communication, collaboration, negotiation, things like that, right? So you can Google more about T-shaped skills. CF Institute has some interesting blogs on that online as well, right? Uh, develop that. So for AI to squeeze us out, it only needs to outperform us in specific abilities, right? Now you're thinking, what is this strategy doing here, right? We were supposed to talk about take off and what? Sorry, take charge and take off <laughs> to leverage your charter. And what am I talking about? What, how does quitting feature in all this? I always like to say I have a master's in quitting, right? Or a PhD in quitting. Let me tell you about my quitting stories, right? So I quit company secretaryship when I was 25. <laughs> Have you heard of CS? Probably heard of CS, right? Older generation probably heard of it right now. It is the old FRM. <laughs> now it is CA, C, C, CFA, FRM, Kaya, right? Then it was what? CA, ICWA, CS. Okay? Right, Ritesh? I quit CS at 25. I quit CPA at 31, right? Lost interest in it. Um, I quit the big four at 34. I had enough of working in you know, rigid traditional organizations. I quit corporate life at 39. I told you a story about being stressed out, sitting in the skyscraper, right? I quit running at 43, okay? Had enough of running, okay? Too painful, too boring. Whenever it gets boring, I quit, okay? I quit entrepreneurship at 47. I, I said, company I set up when I was 39 was acquired when I was 47 by Kaplan. I quit entrepreneurship then, right? Um, I quit CFA prep at 50. I used to love teaching CFA. I don't anymore, right? That's a fact of it. Passion runs this course. So what is the lesson from all this? Is it that you should always quit? No, so what is the lesson? Lesson is move on. But move on when and move on how? You should move on when, what? You quit to win. Always you, should, you should must quit to win, right? And what, what do you mean by quit to win? How do you quit to win? I'm going to give you a checklist for that. But before that, have you heard this? You've probably heard what? Winners never quit and quitters never win. So we're going to change that little bit, little tweak here. Cancel out the never. If you look at many winners, most winners, whether it's Elon Musk or Bill Gates or anything, they have always quit many times over their careers. Agreed? Yeah. But we don't quit. Why don't we quit? What's the reason? Come on, guys. Sorry? It's hard to get why. I know it's hard to get why. Comfort zone, what else? What will others think? Low kya kehenge? Sunk cost fallacy, right? Dreams, I'll get promoted next year. Bonus will come next year. Sorry, e e e EMI, yes. Let's not forget the EMI. Ram is always about money, you know. He's like, money, 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 EMI. Sorry? Very focused, yeah, very focused guy. Huh? His values are very clear. <laughs> I need to see your values at the end of the day, by the way. <laughs> but that is important. So here is a transition checklist because we talked before, the, I mean, we were discussing this event, and I was very keen that I should also talk about how do you quit and when do you quit? Because sometimes you have to quit. Sometimes enough is enough. Agreed? So what is a quitting checklist? Number one, all right, do you know and have the technical skills for the next job? 
So if you're going to equity analysis, do you know financial modeling? Do you know report writing? Basic, right? If you don't, learn that. Number two, do you, know how, do you have the soft skills, right? If you're an equity analyst, I told you about the fact that, you know, you have to be conscientious. You have to be good at communication. You have to be very good at report writing. Your verbal and written skills must be top notch. Thirdly, have you considered your transferable skills? Now, this is something interesting. What are transferable skills? These are skills which you used in your previous job that you can port to your next job. And these are mostly what you think? Technical or soft? Soft. So make a note of that. Most of your transferable skills are actually soft skills. It's communication, negotiation, collaboration, things like that. Right? Fourth one, if you don't have any of the skills, can you learn? Is it possible for you to learn efficiently? That's the fourth question. If you can't, you have an issue. If you can, go ahead. Number five, does the new job involve your top strengths? If it doesn't involve your top strengths, you will be miserable, I can guarantee you. Because you cannot take your weakness and make it a strength overnight. It's not going to happen. It's going to be take a lot of time and effort. It's going to be painful. And eventually, you might be fired or you'll quit yourself. So do you know what your top strengths are? Does it play to your top strengths? Do you know of, and this is a very interesting point, do you know of, and are you willing to make the sacrifices? No one looks at sacrifices when they move into a new job or career or location. Lots of sacrifices are involved, like what? Loss of title maybe, the pay may be less, working hours might be longer, right? You may have to work, you may have to do remote working and uh, on site. You may have to commute a long, long distance to work, many hours on, on the road every day. Okay, family life, work-life balance, sleep, nutrition, all might get affected. Are you, are you factoring this in your decisions or not? A lot of the time we don't. We see title, salary, <laughs> brand, and we jump. Assuming it is yes to all the above, finally, last but not the least, very important question, are the rewards worth it? After doing all this, you know, is it worth it? What are the rewards? It's not just financial. Can you live your values? Is it meeting your definition of success? That's what you mean by rewards, not just monetary rewards. Make sense? I'm going to end with strategy 10, which is about connecting smartly. I'm going to give you a story of someone I met, who's actually right now in Bangalore. He's not at the event. This guy was born in a tier two city. He grew up in a tier two city in India. Middle class family, very average college. He finally passed CA after fourth attempt. He passed on the fifth attempt. So he, he failed CA, CA final four times. So he's an introvert, doesn't talk much, not very articulate. That's the background, okay? He initially started his career four years ago in a bank in Mumbai in loan appraisal. You know what loan appraisal is? Analyzing loans to be given to companies. Nothing much to do with the CFA curriculum at all. Right? Three years later, today, he's working with a multi-billion dollar family office in Bangalore on the buy side. Funny thing, he's not a CFA chart holder. <laughs> he's not even a CFA candidate. He passed level one, I think. So what made him, what, what enabled him to make this switch from credit analyst to buy side, where he's actually what do you call, um, helping the portfolio manager manage the portfolio, has the team of juniors reporting to him. Oh, by the way, I forgot, he's only 27 years old. Okay? How do you do it? Okay? This is what he did. This is what he explained to me. I had a one hour chat with him last year in Coven Park, <laughs> next door. I said, Baya, tell me, how do you do this, right? I want to hear your secret. He used to go and listen to conference called Transcripts of major listed companies in India. He would choose the company. He would listen very carefully, read the transcript, note the important points that he was curious about, right? And then, because there are analysts on the call, right? There are many analysts on the call. He would basically connect with them on LinkedIn. He would send a message saying, hey, I, I read your transcript. It is amazing, some fantastic questions you raised. I have, this is my opinion about this particular issue. He would never ask for a job he would never, ever reach out for a job. What do you think the other guy would do? 
Of course you'd be interested, right? This guy actually showing interest in my work. He's not asking for a job, he's different, right? Other guy would say, you know what? And then he would give insights. This guy would give insights to the analyst about this is maybe another angle to the company you're covering. I found out this about the industry, you know? Without the other guy even asking anything. After a few months of this, what happens? The other guy says, you know what? Let's have a chat. Let's have a coffee chat, right? He meets him for the first time face to face. Okay, again, he doesn't ask for a job. Our friend here doesn't ask for a job. This chats, gives him insights. They have a nice chat, talks about values, goals, career, you know, all those kind of things. Maybe the other guy mentors him a bit, gives him some advice. People like to be asked for advice, right? All those things, the ego, ego boost, right? And six months later, interview call. The two jobs that he got after the bank job were exactly following this process. He, was, he first went to the sell side and went to the buy side. He's very clear, very focused on where he wants to go and how he'll do it. He's not an extrovert. He's not a networker. But he's very curious. He's very passionate. He knows how to acquire the skills. He knows how to connect with people. So even if you're not a networker, you know, a lot of people hate going to events and speaking, right? How many of you hate going to events and speaking to other people? Raise your hands. That'll be funny if you raised your hand at this event. <laughs> that, that, is a, that is a trick question. <laughs> right? But if you're that kind, don't worry. Have very focused, targeted networking, like this guy. Right? In a few years' time, he'll be portfolio manager. In 10 years, he'll be CIO at this rate. Okay? So what are the takeaways from today's talk? Know yourself, explore careers, acquire skills, upgrade your curiosity, show passion, get a mentor, right? Know the culture, very importantly, unlock value of the CFA charter, quit to win, always know when to quit, and why you're quitting, right? And how to quit. And finally, learn to connect smartly. So this talk is all about really what? It's about getting real, right? This is a real talk, okay? Cut the bullshit out. Talk about what's really happening to the market, to you, what you can do about it, right? Because you can't fly your career on autopilot. So it's time to take charge and fly high. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we have time for questions, probably. Can you show the PowerPoint earlier? I want to just go back to the PowerPoint. Yeah, I just want to show this last slide. I'll keep it up on the screen. Yeah. You can stand and talk. Yeah. <laughs> right? So as always, uh, a great and wonderful session, we know, and thank Pleasure. you. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, as I said uh, during the introduction, right, this is going to be genuine from his own experiences and very relatable. So thanks a lot for this. So let's ask them: Was it genuine and relatable? Can you, yes or I no? Felt so. Yes. Good. So I have a set of questions. So I'm I'm going to dig a little deeper into your own personal journey as well through that, uh, and of course I'm sure that will really help people as well. Sure. Uh, some questions I have from the audience, I will park some of them because I had one of my own. Um, so you've spoken and touched upon the importance of knowing your core values, right? Correct. Um, and with a lot of youngsters now, I'm sure a lot of youngsters in this crowd as well, uh, they're more focused on chasing, let's say, money, material wealth, jobs, titles, so on and so forth, right? Um, do you think they'll be really concerned about values at this stage? And were you really concerned about it probably at this age? Well, let's ask them, right? <laughs> let's ask the first question to them. Are you, are you guys honestly really concerned about values at this stage of your career? Yes or no? Well, after listening to me talk about values, if you said no, I'd be very upset. <laughs> but, <laughs> but really, are you? Yeah. Well, they seem to agree. And the second question was? Were you concerned at this? Right. And sure. <laughs> That's what I understood as well, right? So... Uh, just one of the, you know, just to kind of follow up on that, that thing which you were covering here, right? So, most people in organizations, if, if I, you did an exercise where I had to, you know, really rank the values and stuff like that, uh, 
most organizations I've seen, at least in my own experience, is that <laughs> in my own experience I've seen is that uh, a, la a large set of your values are in alignment, but hmm. some are not. Correct. Right? Yeah. So how do you how how do people really kind of take a decision when when some of your values align but some don't? Right? Yeah, that's a very good question, right? I mean, if you've noted down your four values, for example, it's almost impossible to find a company that ticks all the four boxes. I mean, that's not realistic, right? So let's get real, yeah? Let's get practical. So how do you do it? So one solution I have thought about, which I've seen as well work, is you rank your values. Right now, you haven't ranked the values. You just have four values. Try ranking them. Not now, later. That's not exercise for now. Rank them. So for example, if you go to a company, and the, the company asks you to missell financial products. Misselling, yeah? Unethical practice. In your value hierarchy, you have ethics, you also have, like Ram, you have money. <laughs> so you have ethics, you have money, and then you have two other values. But ethics happens to be above money in terms of your value ranking. The decision is easy for you, right? That is, you cannot comply, you cannot miss sell, you may have to leave the company, right? And that's what CFA, Standards of Professional Conduct, says anyway, you have to disassociate in some shape or form. If money is above ethics, Right? Then the decision is clear for you, and so are the consequences of what you do. So that is one way of very, very, you know, very simple example of once you prioritize your values, then when this conflict comes up, which it will normally in corporate life, it, must, it always happens, right? That's how you sort it out, right? The better solution is not to get into situations like that in the first place, <laughs> where you know that the corporate values are not in line with your values, and you know that at some point you'll be asked to compromise your values. So don't go there in the first place, right? You avoid this whole issue of conflict, like they say in CFA, um, standards of professional conduct, right? The best way of avoiding conflict of interest is to <laughs> avoid conflict of interest, right? <laughs> don't even go there to start with. But that's idealistic, right, to start with, yeah. Thanks, thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, recently, not recently, a few, few months back, I was reading a book, I came across this quote, right? And, and it says, when preparation uh, required to deliver an objective meets a suitable opportunity, the outcome is success, right? Right. How do you define success? And, and what are the three things probably you would say are the top most things important for success? Well, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> How do I define success? Uh, that's just my definition, by the way. And, and you don't have to copy-paste. You'll have, all have your definition of success, whatever it is, right? So initially, it changed. Initially, my definition of success when I was younger, in my 20s, you know, like you guys, was... Um, work, do meaningful work, do sexy work, right? Get recognized. Money was not very important for me even then. But get recognized, get promoted. Uh, so recognition was very important for me. Then I got in my 30s, recognition became less important. Into our 40s, it became more of leaving my values. So that incident I mentioned when I turned 39 in my sure. last corporate job, that sort of like was like, like you know, eye-opener. It was mind-blowing. But I realized that for me, I, 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 comparison with my colleagues or my peers or my friends was meaningless. I didn't need to. Um, and happiness, I found out at that stage, after 40 years of living, was more about, can I live my values every day or not? That's it. Irrespective of the title or the company or the salary or whatever. So that is my definition of values. Can you live your values substantially and regularly? Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I, th I think I'll take some questions from the audience now. Um, so one we have from Pallav. Um, how to transition from one area of financial services to another without taking a salary hit if you're a well-settled, experienced professional? Wow, it's like, huh? <laughs> I think that's a whole golden grail, right? Or the holy grail. <laughs> Sorry, do I, oh, I think I have this one. Sorry. It's a holy grail of uh, how do you make a transition without taking a salary hit, right? It's tough because a lot of times when you take, you do transitions, you do it for a reason, right? So I was talking to somebody earlier today, and that person was saying he's made several career changes during his career, but every career change, his salary has gone down. <laughs> <laughs> but my question to him was, are you living your values? Right? So salary might have been going down, but is your life satisfaction going up? And the answer is probably yes. Right? So I think uh, doing a transition successfully, <laughs> taking all the boxes, right? and being happy, and getting a salary hike at the top of that is going to be extremely tough. 
right? It's going to be extremely tough. So there's no, there's no, uh, I don't know of any way around it, to be honest, right? Uh, luck plays a part. Who you know plays a part, to be honest. Because if you know somebody, there'll be no job ads. It's just you, right? Then you negotiate, you get a better deal. If you don't know people, you're just interviewing with many others, hundreds of others, right? You're a commodity. You don't stand out. That's my long answer. But any, any other views? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Is, are the rewards worth it? The last question was, are the rewards worth it? And the rewards is what you define. What are your rewards that you're looking for, right? Okay. So I have one more. It's a little kind of, he's made it a little personal, but I'll anyways, ask that. Uh, I'm 36 years old, CFA, FRM, working as a front office business analyst of a trading and risk technology platform. I'm also basic level Python and machine learning coding knowledge. Now it seems difficult to get into any front office control apart from my own technology domain. What kind of role should I target to rise in the finance industry and get more pay? And what are the skills that I need to improve for those roles? Wow. A lot. So how to get to know about those jobs <laughs> as it's difficult, right? I think the <laughs> entire session was on that, but I feel just want to re-summarize that again for this person. Um, I'm not going to. I think, we, <laughs> I think we are running short on time anyway. I'm happy to discuss with you one-on-one -on -one after yeah. the session, and that's better. Yeah. Yeah, probably yeah. the individual set of questions, I think. Yeah. Please use the day to kind of network it's with a pretty, the leaders and, and get your questions. It's a long answer, by the way, yeah? yeah. And we have uh, time issues. Okay. Uh, so what are the top three things which you know now, but wish you knew when you were much younger? Which I wish I had known when I was much younger. <laughs> wow, okay. You go back to the list of regrets, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm opening my regrets book now. I wish I was more curious when I was younger. I, I'm, I'm much more curious at this age of 54 than I was at 24 or 34. I was not that open-minded. That's one thing. And I missed out on a lot, I think, in terms of many things, right? Careers, relationships, whatever it is, right? Um, that's the first thing. Second thing, I wish I knew myself more when I was younger. I did not. I was very externally focused like most of us, right? Job, title, salary, brand, blah, blah, blah. Never thought about what I really wanted. Um, the CA was what, what society wanted from you, right? So I became a chartered accountant, right? Um, my dad was a chartered accountant. <laughs> my grandfather was a chartered accountant. You know? So it's like passed on down, right? So yeah, I become a CA, right? There's no option. Never thought of what I wanted to do. That's the second thing. Third thing I, I really wish I had known, and this I learned during my entrepreneurship journey. I wish I knew how to manage people or relate with people better. I really wish that. Because when I was young, you know how youngsters are typically, you know, you're arrogant, you're impatient, you're judgmental, you don't understand, you don't care about other people, right? You don't tolerate other people. It's just my way or the highway. At least that was me, to a large extent. So three things. I wish I had known myself more. I wish I had known how to deal with people better. And I wish I was more curious. Um, but I'm trying to make up for that now. <laughs> In some way, yeah. Uh, so I want to end my line of questioning. I see that the time is already up. I think we've crossed the time. Um, so last question about your book, Let's Get Real. Yes. Uh, I know you did share about how the idea came about and stuff, but why should a CFA candidate or a charter holder sitting here really read this book? So during my journey from you know, CA, CFA, corporate life, entrepreneurship, now I coach, I had to reinvent the wheel many times. You know what that means, right? I had to learn things on my own. Which I, which I wish I hadn't had to do. It is hugely inefficient. It's unnecessary, actually. Because something which Ram or Amit or Fardeen or Mohan has gone through is probably applicable to me as well, right? So I think the book is basically just to stop you reinventing the wheel. It's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a list of hacks. And secondly, I think we talked about T-shaped skills earlier. I think a lot of people have domain expertise, but they don't have the breadth. They lack in soft skills, and they get stuck beyond a particular point. They can't progress. Not even in jobs, but even in interviews, they don't get forward, right? So I think it's absolutely essential for CFA charter holders, young charter holders, and candidates to go through that and to bridge that employability gap. My last talk in Bangalore was called Closing the Employability Gap. Similar theme here, right? Right now, you are qualified, but you're not job ready. You're a candidate, but you're not job ready yet. The book will hopefully make you job ready. That's my brief answer. And just as a reminder, I think uh, he already alluded to, the physical copies are available outside. Yeah, about 100 copies I'm outside. I'm going to buy my own. Uh, recommend everyone please do buy your own copies as well and you can have it signed if 
We know <laughs> yes, absolutely. We sign and take a picture and upload on LinkedIn. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> there's, if there's no picture, it didn't happen, right? That's how what they say. Yeah. And by the way, there's a link to the test that will show your values and traits. Okay, I'll send the link to you, but first you have to post something on LinkedIn and tag CFS Society and me. <laughs> and then I'll send the link to you. But we'll meet outside the event, yeah. So thank you for this wonderful sure. uh, and very insightful session. Binod, the guys, a huge round of applause for Mr. Binod. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.